Hey everybody, welcome to our clearinghouse meeting on May 23rd. We're delighted to co-sponsor this meeting with Americans United for the separation of church and state. And um, Maggie Garrett, a longtime friend from AU and uh, their vice president for public policy will be emceeing uh, the content of this meeting. And we're delighted to have you. Um, and we're hoping to learn a lot about the general principles of why the importance of church and state is important and why it's particularly important uh, as we uh, attend to uh, many of our women's issues of great concern. Uh, so uh, without any more ado, I'll turn it over to Maggie. All right, thank you so much. Um, we are really excited to be here uh, today to talk to you about the importance of church-state separation for feminists. Um, so I'm the VP of Public Policy at Americans United for Separation of Church and State. We are a 75 plus year old national organization um, that focuses purely on church-state separation issues. We believe that it is important to have church-state separation to protect the religious freedom of everyone, both people of faith and non-believers, which is why um, Americans United um, is sort of an umbrella group of all people of different faiths, um, Christians, non-Christians, and um, the non-religious. Um, I've been working on these issues for about 20 years, both with AU, then the ACLU, and then back to AU. Um, and so most of my life has been this stuff. And as I was actually saying earlier, um, I actually come to church state separation from a um, sort of an unexpected background at this point, though it was pretty normal at the time. And it was my uh, Lutheran pastor and my Republican father who taught me uh, the importance of church state separation as a way to ensure religious freedom for all people. Um, so that's me. Um, and I want to introduce um, my colleagues. Um, Dina, do you want to go first and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Dina Scher. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm the Associate Vice President for Public Policy at Americans United. Um, and I have been working on this issue for not quite as long as Maggie, but close. Um, and also almost mind since I graduated from law school, um, I've been at AU and the ACLU focusing on these issues. Um, and in particular, looking at the way that um, religious freedom and church state separation intersect with um, access to healthcare, women's equality, and LGBTQ equality. Um, and Catherine. Hey, um, my name's Catherine Foy. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I um, am a, one of the legal fellows at Americans United. Um, uh, there are three of us, and if you've never heard of what that means, uh, a lot of nonprofits have fellowship programs for uh, 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 people who are uh, right out of law school or a few years out of law school to um, really kind of uh, learn the ropes and, and start their careers in, in a public interest role. And so um, I have been working on this issue for about 10 months. Um, but uh, before law school, I got a master's in public health and I worked in healthcare for a couple of years. Um, and there's a big intersection between church state separation issues and, and healthcare, as you'll learn about today. Um, so it's been really um, cool to uh, apply that knowledge to my work here. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you all today. Thanks. Um, so the way we're going to do this today might be a little different from um, some of the ways you've done it in the past. I am going to give a little church state 101 overview because the law is very complicated, um, which is why we actually love this because it's really interesting. Um, so we'll do a church state 101 and then I am going to sort of facilitate some questions um, from Catherine or to Catherine and to Dina about some of the stuff that's like really happening uh, day to day. So, so let's talk about church state separation. The separation of church and state protects all of us. It makes our country more fair, more equal, more inclusive. Um, and some of the top things that I think church state in, uh, separation is important for include 
Um, it ensures that you can pr practice any religion or no religion at all without government interference so long as you don't harm others. It safeguards houses of worship from intrusion by the government. It prevents religious institutions from using the government to impose their religion on you and other people. It protects parents who want to send their children to public schools without fear that they'll be coerced into participating in prayer or religious activities. It protects taxpayers from being forced to fund the religious activities and education of others. And it ensures that all Americans feel welcome and treated equally under the law, regardless of their religion. At its core, the separation of church and state is about equality. It ensures that all people, whether religious or not, are treated the same. And this allows all of us to live as ourselves and believe as, our, as we choose. When church and state aren't separated, it threatens all of our rights, but women in particular are affected. Um, and while many religions and perhaps even the majority of religious people in this country support women's equality, there's a strong and very powerful voice of conservative white Christian nationalists who don't. And they want to use the government to pass laws that reflect their regressive belief. And that's why um, we see what we're seeing to today. We are seeing efforts to adopt religious beliefs into our laws, including things like abortion bans and birth control restrictions that adopt one religious belief about where life begins. Dress codes in schools that require girls to wear gender specific clothes and bar them from wearing pants. Policies that allow taxpayer funded religious organizations to refuse to hire single pregnant women, divorced mothers and women in same sex relationships. Exemptions from employers who wanna pay women less than men uh, because they're not supposed to be heads of households and funding for private schools that teach gendered curriculum and discriminate against students and teachers. Um, so that's sort of the, the gist of why church state separation is important. And now I just want to give you a little, as I said, a 101 on, on um, background on, on what the law is and where it comes from. So many of you probably know that there are two key uh, religion clauses in the Constitution. The first one is the Establishment Clause that says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And that's the provision that, that provides a separation of church and state. It keeps the government from advancing, privileging, disparaging religion or non-religion. There are many today, like Lauren Boebert, maybe Marjorie Taylor Greene, who will claim that church-state separation isn't in the Constitution because it isn't in the words, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Um, but the principle is in there. Separation is a shorthand for the principle espoused by the Establishment Clause. So you would never argue you don't have a right to religious freedom or to a fair trial, even though those words also aren't in the Constitution. In fact, there's actually few things more American than the separation of church and state. We invented it. Um, until ours, no nation had sought to protect the people's right to think freely by separating uh, religion and government, and it's in the fabric of our constitution and the fabric of our nation. So that's the establishment clause. The next clause is the free exercise clause, and that says government may not prohibit the free exercise of religion. This clause has less power than you think, although the current Supreme Court is really trying hard to change that and change that rapidly. But in the 1990s, there was a case called Employment Division versus Smith, um, written by Justice Scalia, and they held that the free exercise simply means the government must pass neutral and generally applicable law. So in other words, the government can't target religious practice for worse treatment unless it has a compelling interest. So that decision was decided in the 90s and um, making the free exercise clause kind of weak. And at the time, we and another a bunch of other organizations on the right and the left um, religious and secular, conservative, progressive, were really concerned because we thought Employment Division versus Smith really gutted the free exercise clause. Um, and we were really concerned about what this would mean for people who practiced minority faiths. And so we all banded together and passed a law, which you may have heard of, um, and you probably don't like it now. And it's called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act or RIFRA. And we put back in place the test 
um, that existed before Smith to give a little more power to claims of um, infringing on your free exercise rights. So essentially it says, um, if a law burdens a person's religion, um, not a minimal burden, but a real burden, if there's a substantial burden, the government must prove it has a compelling interest to enforce the law and it's the least restrictive way to do it. So that is what RIFRA says. We thought RIFRA was a great idea. As it turns out, it's not a great idea. Um, it is not working out um, after years and years because people are trying to misuse it and they're using it to miss to harm other people. They are just using it to discriminate against LGBTQ people, women, religious minorities, to deny health care, um, all things that Dina and Catherine are going to talk about today. Um, and before I get to the, the questions for them, I just also want to sort of set out that though I'm saying, you know, the establishment clause is the separation of church and state, and the free exercise clause doesn't have a lot of power. Um, there's been a lot going on with these clauses these days. And the current Supreme Court. Um, which I'm sure you talk about a lot in this group, um, is really trying to make the, the establishment clause meaningless and the free exercise clause with a lot of power to the point where they're trying to make it so the establishment clause actually violates the free exercise clause. So the free exercise clause is gaining power, RIFRA is gaining power, and the establishment clause is losing power, um, which is why it's more important than ever that we're talking about these issues today. So I'm going to bring in Dina and Catherine, and we're going to talk about issues surrounding health care, social services, employment discrimination, and education. Um, and then I should have mentioned that we're hoping to talk for about until about one, and then we'll open things up for questions. Um, so Dina, I want to start with you. One of the most clear examples of religion being used to, die, to deny women in health care, we're going to start with the health care topic, is the Hobby Lobby case. I know many of the people in this audience are familiar with that case, but Dina, can you discuss a little bit more about what happened and how it pulled in RIFRA and religious freedom issues? Sure, sure. Um, I'm gonna talk about a little, start with birth control, which the importance of birth control, which I know everybody knows, but it's always nice to hear why Hobby Lobby, why we got to Hobby Lobby. Birth control protects women's health, and helps women plan their families. It allows them to participate in the workforce and pursue their education. In other words, it's critical to women's health and equality. And so that's why when the Affordable Air Care Act was passed and then implemented, it required most health insurance plans to cover birth control. This should be, this was, it should not have been controversial, um, but, since the very beginning of that, the birth control benefit, um, it was controversial. It was a subject of multiple lawsuits and lots of policy changes. Um, so going back to the very beginning, when the Obama administration in, um, implemented the birth control benefit, houses of worship were exempt from the general rule. Um, that health insurance plans must cover contraception. Houses of worship didn't have to, never had to provide their employees with health insurance, with insurance coverage for contraception. Employees working for these organizations had to do that on their own. Um, but opponents of contraception argued that that exemption was insufficient and it should apply to nonprofit organizations, including universities and even for-profit corporations. Um, so that's kind of what set up the challenges that we saw. So, um, in 2013, kind of giving in to some of the public pressure, the government created an accommodation to the contraceptive coverage requirement for religiously affiliated nonprofits, um, including universities. So, um, like including Notre Dame, so some very big employers. Um, the accommodation would allow these institutions to opt out of providing coverage, um, but their employees would still get it. All the employer had to do was notify the government and the government would step in and ensure the employees got coverage. Um, it seemed like a good compromise at the time, um, but 
it, uh, the accommodation failed to appease many of the nonprofit institutions and they challenged it in court. They wanted a full exemption that stripped their employees and students of contraceptive coverage altogether. And at the same time, owners of for-profit corporations filed dozens of cases arguing that they too should get an exemption because providing contraceptive coverage for their employees violated their religious beliefs. Um, so that was kind of a remarkable because it was the first time that there was sort of a widespread movement among for-profit companies to say that we have religious beliefs and we need to, you know, it kind of impose our religion on our employees. Um, so that's kind of the background that led to the 2014 decision in Hobby Lobby. Um, there, the Supreme Court held that a large, closely held for-profit corporation could use RIFRA, the, the law Maggie mentioned earlier, to deny its employees birth control benefits that are guaranteed by the ACA. Um, as everybody knows, Hobby Lobby is a large national craft chain store that employs tens of thousands of people. So this had a widespread effect on the women who work there, their families, their dependents. Um, Hobby Lobby argued that the or the the court said that the religion of the company's owners prohibited it from um, providing health insurance that covers FDA approved uh, forms of contraception. Um, the court said for the first time that RIFRA could be used to grant for-profit corporations a religious exemption. And this allowed Hobby Lobby's owners to impose their religious beliefs on the, their uh, company's employees. The opinion resulted in a RIFRA test that's unbalanced. So Maggie talked about how you have to have a real burden and that even if there is a burden on exercise, the government has a, if the government has a compelling interest and it's um, a narrow way of, of putting, advancing that interest, that it, that's okay, you can still burden religion. But what happened after Hobby Lobby is that the Supreme Court sort of upset that balance in that test. Um, it's easier to demonstrate what a burden is that qualifies for a RIFRA exemption. And it's more difficult for the government to show that it has a compelling interest and it's advancing them in advancing that interest in a way that is um, narrow. So as a result of Hobby Lobby, substantial burden in the test is kind of whatever you say it is. Um, so if I don't like a government policy, I can say that I don't like that policy and that's kind of enough for the court in these days. It also includes the concept of complicity. If someone else is doing something I don't like, my religious exercise is burdened. And that's, again, that's okay with the court following Hobby Lobby. Um, second, the government has to show that it has a compelling interest in applying the policy to each and every person or company that challenges it. But that becomes impossible for the government to do after Hobby Lobby, especially where there might already be a narrow exemption in place, as there was with the for churches and other houses of worship. And then uh, it got broadened a little bit to cover nonprofit institutions. But because of that, the for-profit companies said, wait, we need one too. And the court said, oh, well, if you've given an exemption to these other entities, then you don't, then it's easy for you to get an exemption here. So even, in situations where there may be a narrow exemption in place that's been negotiated by policymakers and may actually lift a burden that exists on religious exercise, that can sort of be used by entities looking to get out of laws altogether. Um, and they kind of bootstrap onto that. Um, so, the other thing that um, 
you should keep in mind is that the establishment clause, which Maggie explained, should limit RIFRA, right? You can't use RIFRA to create an exemption that causes harm. Um, and there was clear harm in this instance because people lost out on getting birth control coverage. Um, the Supreme Court did pay lip service to this idea, but at the same time, it minimized the challenges that people face in getting birth control before the ACA. Basically said, that's, it didn't even, didn't even really acknowledge that there was a challenge. It, it was hard for women to get birth control. And then it's important to keep in mind that Hobby Lobby is not an anomaly. There is a case in Texas that's going on where a court said that a for-profit employer has a RIFRA right not to cover PrEP, which is an HIV prevention medication. And then a nurse who works at a VA hospital in Texas and who has been given an accommodation not to provide abortion care is trying to use RIFRA to stop the facility, the whole facility, the whole hospital from providing abortions at all. So, um, this is that's just sort of a little background of how RIFRA is being misused to deny people health healthcare, um, and how the court has ignored the establishment clause limits on what RIFRA is supposed to do. Dina, I have one more question for that um, for a quick answer because we have a lot more to go into, but. Um, so RIFRA is behind Hobby Lobby, which says that, you know, you can use religion to deny your, um, your employees a healthcare benefit when it violates their, you know, supposed religious belief, a religious belief of a, a somehow of a company. Um, is there anything we can do to try to fix RIFRA? Yes. Um, following Hobby Lobby, we began to think about how to restore RIFRA. Um, the result of this work is the Do No Harm Act, and this was recently re reintroduced in Congress by um, Representative Bobby Scott, Steve Cohen, Jamie Raskin, Mary Gay Scanlon, and Senator Booker. Um, the Do No Harm Act would amend RIFRA and restore it to its original intent. It preserves RIFRA's power to protect religious freedom and clarifies that it can't be used to harm others, such as permitting discrimination or denying health care. Um, and yeah, it would, um, it's a really important bill and it just takes RIFRA and says you can't use it in certain circumstances, like to get out of civil rights laws or laws that require access to healthcare in order, you can't use RIFRA to get out of those laws because that would cause harm to other people. Okay. So if there is something you're looking to do now, if you're if you're thinking about Hobby Lobby and like what could you do about Hobby Lobby now since it's, you know, there's been many cases on it, one thing you could do is go to au.org and um, we should have an action alert up there and you can ask your member of Congress to um, endorse the Do No Harm Act, which will set, re sort of set um, uh, RIFRA, which is going to come up a whole bunch more times as we're discussing uh, more uh, current issues. Um, so sticking on the, the topic of healthcare, Catherine, um, obviously everyone in the Zoom knows that the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in the Dobbs decision. Um, and in that case, the, the court was really deciding whether or not women had a privacy right to control their own bodies. Um, but the establishment clause, though not involved in Dobbs and Roe, um, has a role to play in the abortion issue as well. Um, Catherine, can you tell us about our recent um, abortion lawsuit in Missouri that AU filed along with National Women's Law Center? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, as Maggie just explained, Roe v. Wade held that uh, the 14th Amendment conferred a right to privacy uh, and that basically pre-viability abortion bans violated that right because they intruded on a pregnant person's uh right to make that private decision about their own bodies. Um, when the court overturned Roe and Dobbs, um, that left reproductive rights advocates searching for other ways to secure the right to an abortion. And it turns out that back in uh, pre-Roe days, before the court had located the right to abortion in the 14th Amendment, 
uh, litigators were making all kinds of constitutional argument, including some argument based on the religion clauses, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. So what we did at AU was not totally new, uh, but because of Roe, no one had to uh, be creative and make these kinds of arguments um, you know, in the past 50 years. Um, so what we did is in January, we filed a lawsuit in Missouri State Court challenging Missouri's abortion ban, as well as a few other of their uh, abortion restrictions, um, based on the state's version of the Establishment Clause. And um, so not the federal Establishment Clause, but the Missouri State Constitution has several provisions that are kind of its equivalent of that. Um, and our argument uh, is that in enacting these abortion restrictions, the Missouri legislature enshrined in law a particular narrow Christian belief about when life begins and uh, that they're forcing everyone to abide by that belief, um, making that an unconstitutional establishment of, of religion. Um, so our plaintiffs in that, in that case are 14 clergy members uh, representing seven different denominations uh, who all insist that the, the Missouri legislature is imposing a religious belief about abortion that is very different from their own. Um, and the reason that we picked Missouri um, as our first state to try to bring a case like this is that they were very clear about what they were doing in passing these laws. Um, they actually wrote into the abortion ban statute uh, that Almighty God is the author of life. Um, and when the legislators were debating the various bills, um, they made overtly religious statements uh, in support of them. Um, and so uh, we also brought this lawsuit in Missouri because Missouri has actually more robust protections for separation of church and state and its state constitution than the federal establishment clause does. Um, and that was important because it makes, well, on the one hand, it makes a win more possible, um, but it's also important because uh, the fact that the state and federal establishment clauses are treated differently here uh, means that if the state court were to make a decision based on its own constitution, the U.S. Supreme Court would not have any jurisdiction to review that decision. Um, and that was really important to us because we knew that nothing good could come of letting the Supreme Court get their hands on a case like this. So it's really um, uh, kind of an interesting test case to see, um, you know, what, what a state court with robust uh, church-state separation uh, provisions might do with, with this kind of argument. Um, it's also, also worth noting that since Roe fell, uh, there have been a few other abortion lawsuits around the country, uh, country that have made religion arguments as well. Um, however, so far, those have all been free exercise or RIFRA cases uh, where the plaintiffs have said, my religion requires that I have access to an abortion, so I'm entitled to an exemption from the law. Um, our case is different in that it's the first one to bring an establishment claim against an abortion ban. Um, and as we already kind of talked about, there are a lot of dangers in using RIFRA and the Free Exercise Clause um, to sort of expand rights because of the ways that those um, provisions can be easily misused in ways that we don't agree with. Um, so that was another important part of our strategy that we were rooting our argument in you know, uh, an establishment clause argument. Um, and if we were to win on that argument, the laws that we're challenging will be completely struck down rather than just permitting exemptions for people who can prove that they have a religious basis for an abortion, which would be the case in the RIFRA or the free exercise cases that you might've heard of. Um, yeah, I'll turn it back to you, Maggie. Thanks. Okay, so that's healthcare. So we gave two examples of, um, you know, healthcare, birth control, um, PrEP, Dina was talking about, can um, is they're getting exemptions, so you have to provide that. Um, you know, we've got abortion cases. Um, let's go to social services and how church state comes up in that. And, and Catherine, I'm actually going to turn it um, back to you again for the first question, which is, um, can you tell us about um, the Supreme Court and AU cases on discrimination by I think this question, I think I wrote my question wrong, but essentially there are lawsuits out there about discrimination by foster care agencies. Um, and, and can you tell us a little bit about those? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, discrimination and thinking about social services, um, discrimination by foster care agencies is a really big issue, uh, that comes up in this area. Um, there are 
because there are a ton of religious foster care agencies. And it's very common for state and city governments to contract, to, to contract with those agencies to help match prospective parents with children in the foster system. Um, and so as you can imagine, religious foster care agencies might have all kinds of parents that they want to discriminate against. Think same-sex parents, unmarried parents, uh, parents that are of the wrong religion, et cetera. Um, and so I'm sure I don't have to tell you that this kind of discrimination has highly gendered implications. Um, uh, single women make up almost 25% of, of adopted parents, uh, uh, which doesn't sound like a lot, but the majority is, is married parents, but 25% um, uh, are women uh, compared to single men who are only 3.2%. Uh, of adoptive parents. So uh, when foster care agencies discriminate against unmarried parents, you know, the numbers tell us that they're really discriminating against unmarried women. Um, and uh, also uh, same-sex couples are seven times more likely to raise adopted and foster children than straight couples. Um, in addition, uh, nearly 20% of foster youth are LGBTQ and um, they really need affirming parents. Um, so, uh, you know, of course, I'm sure you all understand that discrimination against LGBT folks, you know, stems in large part from patriarchal notions about gender roles. So discrimination in foster care um, really is a, a, a significant gender justice issue um, that we should be talking about. Um, so I just want to tell you about a few cases on this issue. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the big Supreme Court case uh, on this, which is Fulton v. City of Philadelphia, uh, which just was decided by the Supreme Court in uh, 2021, so just a couple years ago. Um, in that case, uh, Philadelphia uh, contracted with private foster care agencies, as is very common, um, some of whom are religious, to help place foster children in appropriate homes. Um, the contract had a um, non-discrimination requirement, which is typical for these kinds of contracts, and it prohibited discrimination based on sexual orientation. Um, and when the city learned that one particular agency, uh, Catholic Social Services, um, had a policy of not serving same-sex couples, uh, the city stopped referring children to them. Um, so Catholic Social Services sued, claiming the free exercise clause entitled them to an exemption uh, from the non-discrimination requirement in their contract. Um, and the, the Supreme Court agreed with Catholic Social Services, um, but on somewhat narrow grounds. Um, uh, in Philadelphia specifically, uh, the city commissioner had total discretion to grant individualized exemptions from the non-discrimination requirement. And so the court held that where such a system of discretionary exemptions exists, officials have to grant exemptions for substantial religious burdens unless they can satisfy a really high legal standard for not granting them. Um, and so, uh, so it was, you know, it was definitely a loss, um, but it certainly could have been worse in that um, it didn't, uh, it, it, a lot of people thought that the court was going, going to overrule Smith in that case, um, which was the case uh, that Maggie mentioned at the very beginning, um, a free exercise case that uh, said that, you know, uh, you know, as long as laws are neutral and generally applicable, um, you basically, you know, you don't get an exemption from them. They decided um, Smith still applies here, but this wasn't actually neutral and generally applicable because there was these totally discretionary exemptions. Um, and so they had to give a religious exemption. Um, and then uh, I'll just talk in some depth about, uh, uh, AU is actually working on three different sort of foster care related cases right now. I'll just talk about one of them and, and then just mention the other two. Um, uh, but uh, the, the first one um, that I'm gonna talk about is uh, Madonna versus uh, Department of Health and Human Services. And that's a case that's about to be decided in the District Court of South Carolina. Um, and in that case, our plaintiff is Amy Madonna, who is a Catholic mother of three who wanted to foster, uh, volunteer with foster children in the hopes that she would eventually foster and adopt. Um, so she approached her local foster care agency uh, called Miracle Hill, uh, which was an evangelical Protestant agency. Um, and Miracle Hill, Miracle Hill turned her away because they only allow fellow evangelical Protestants to work with foster children. Um, and they require uh, 
volunteers and foster parents to sign their evangelical Protestant statement of faith and uh, literally to attend one of the churches on their approved list of churches. Um, so blatant religious discrimination. And because Mrs. Madonna was Catholic, she couldn't sign that statement. And of course, she didn't attend a Protestant church. Um, and Miracle Hill has turned away at least 25, possibly 30 other families um, that we know of, most of whom were also Catholic, and at least uh, some of whom were same-sex couples. Um, so Miracle Hill's actions were actually in violation of South Carolina's non-discrimination requirements for foster care agencies. Um, and they were also in violation of uh, the Department of Health and Human Services non-discrimination requirements for the grants that they give to states for their foster care programs. Um, so we represent Mrs. Madonna in a lawsuit against both the state and the federal government. Um, because what happened is instead of stopping the unlawful discrimination, the governor of South Carolina issued an executive order that created a blanket waiver allowing all religious foster care agencies to opt out of the state's non-discrimination requirements. Um, and HHS, Health and Human Services, basically did a similar thing. In response to the governor's uh, request, it granted a waiver for South Carolina to not have to follow the non-discrimination requirements of the HHS grant program. Um, so the gist here of the legal argument is that the government cannot create sweeping waivers for religious institutions to not have to follow the law. Uh, that's a violation of the Establishment Clause because it gives religious group preferential treatment. Um, you know, as we saw in Fulton, the Free Exercise Clause sometimes requires, re requires religious exemptions, but those exemptions have to be individualized. Um, they take into account various particular circumstances of that a specific case to determine whether an exemption is warranted and appropriate and permissible under the Establishment Clause, um, uh, because uh, an exemption that goes too far can actually violate the Establishment Clause. So blanket waivers are certainly not individualized exemptions, um, and they go far beyond violating the Establishment Clause. So that's our our legal argument there. Um, and so those two cases give you a pretty good picture of of, you know, we've got one free exercise case there, Fulton, one establishment clause case, um, uh, Madonna, um, of sort of what's going on in this area of the law. Um, I'll just mention uh, two other cases uh, uh, just um, that we're currently working on. Um, uh, we're representing a Jewish couple in Tennessee, uh, the Root and Rams, uh, who were turned away from a United Methodist foster care agency who uh, just like Miracle, Miracle Hill required parents to sign a statement of faith that, uh, that this Jewish couple obviously couldn't sign. Um, and similar to what South Carolina's governor did with his executive order uh, in Tennessee, the legislature passed a law authorizing foster care agencies to deny services based on their religious policies. Uh, so we, we sued the state in that case. Um, and then the other case, uh, Maruf uh, v. Becerra, um, uh, that's in the district court of, of DC, and we represent a same-sex sex couple who lives in Fort, Fort Worth, Texas, who wanted to provide a home for an unaccompanied refugee child. Um, and they approached uh, Catholic Charities of Fort Worth, uh, which receives federal funds to assist with the placement of refugee children. Um, and they were turned away because as a same-sex couple, they didn't mirror the Holy Family. And so we sued the Office of Refugee Resettlement within HHS uh, for underwriting discrimination by its grantees. Um, and yeah, that, that was a lot, but um, really an interesting and big issue, a lot of foster care cases. Um, it's just an area where this comes up over and over again. So I'll kick it back to Maggie. So, so that concept is um, it's government services and they are turning people away because they can't meet a religious test. So it's government funding, government programs, kids in government care, um, and they're saying that they only work with people of certain religions, um, that harms the, the kids in the, in the program, it uh, discriminates against people who want um, to foster children. Dina, are there other places, um, sort of briefly, that, um, that work, that, that, that deal with social service problems other than, a, than foster care? Sure, yeah. Um... As many people know, the government funds many, many critical services that people, especially women and families, need in their daily lives. 
food banks, homicide domestic violence shelters, drops, job training centers, elder care providers. The sort of the list is actually sort of endless. Um, and it's important to know that the government has long partnered with faith-based organizations to do so. Um, the faith-based providers though have always followed, followed the same rule as secular providers. So for instance, they couldn't include religious activities in the services they provide. This is not only required by the constitution, that's sort of logical, right? You can't fund religion, but it's also a key way to protect the religious freedom of people who use the services and it ensures they get the help they need. But about 20 years ago, some people decided that they wanted to use government funded service, social services to save people. And by save people, I mean, save their souls. Um, in order to do so, they had to figure out a way around the pesky constitution. Um, so during the George W. Bush administration, um, the federal agencies that distribute millions, if not billions of dollars annually to fund these social services adopted a series of regulations that were intended to blur the line separating church and state. So it became easier to pressure people seeking services who are often vulnerable and at a vulnerable time in their lives to participate in religious programming. The Obama administration came in and put in protections for people who use the services. They could, for instance, they could ask for an alternative provider if they felt uncomfortable with the religious provider. So with, what does it mean to have these safeguards in place? Let's just think about kind of like how one might seek services. So for example, if a woman, women, uh, sorry, a woman and her children who were the victims of domestic violence and needed housing go to a faith-based provider, um, but the woman felt that the abuse she suffered was rooted in her abuser's religious beliefs, she and her children would be forced to endure an environment they felt was traumatizing. And sometimes there may be pressure to, um, you know, you can get a toy for your child if you attend religious services. So those kind of things, if, if the safeguards aren't in place, that's the kind of experience people can have when they seek social services. Um, so the Obama administration put safeguards in place and then the Trump administration, not surprisingly, stripped those protections and even suggested that faith-based providers could ignore program requirements um, on who can be served and what services can be provided. So the Biden administration has proposed undoing those Trump changes and restore many of the safeguards. But I think the bottom line to remember is that even though this is you know, how the, the rules around how government partners with faith-based organizations to deliver social services, at bottom, what these protections do is that they protect the people getting the services. Without them, people won't feel comfortable and the safeguards ensure that people don't fall through the cracks because if they, they don't want to have religion imposed on them and they don't want to end up, um, just deciding to not seek services because they feel very uncomfortable and they are worried that they are going to have to, you know, participate in religious activities. So that's like a, it's just another kind of quick snapshot overview of how church state separation is really important um, in delivering social services. Okay, let's move on to um, employment discrimination. Um, Catherine. Why does having a strong separation of church and state protect women from discrimination in employment? Can you give us some examples? Yeah, so um, the example that I am going to start out with is uh, a sort of little known doctrine called the ministerial exception. And I'm going to try to, it sounds really wonky, but I'm going to try to just explain it in really straightforward terms. Um, it, but it has huge implications for employment discrimination and um, potentially especially for women. Um, so the ministerial exception is a doctrine made up by judges in response to the wave of employment protections that came about with the passage of laws like Title VII, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, the, uh, the ADA, the Americans uh, with Disabilities Act, et cetera. 
um, basically what happened is judges started to realize that if they took Title VII at its word, that you can't discriminate in employment based on sex, for example, um, a woman would be able to sue uh, the Catholic Church for refusing to let her be a priest. Um, and so they said, this, you know, judges were like, this can't be right. We need to create some kind of judge-made exemption here um, or exception. And so the ministerial exception in simple terms is a carve out in employment discrimination law that says that if an employee serves a vital religious function, like a priest being the classic example, then religious employers must be able to hire and fire them like at their sole discretion without government interference um, because religious groups need to be free to choose their own faith leaders. Um, so that actually makes sense. Like when properly and narrowly applied, uh, the ministerial exception, exception actually up upholds the, the principle of separation of church and state because it keeps government out of what are really core religious decisions um, that the government has no business interfering with. Um, but unfortunately, um, as the theme, uh, as you've probably seen as a theme of this talk, you know, religious conservatives have been trying to expand this doctrine in, in two frightening ways. Um, one in, in who counts as a minister and in what kinds of legal claims are barred by this exception. So if uh, you're taking the first in turn about who counts as a minister, uh, if religious extremists get their way, the ministerial exception would apply to every employee of every religious organization, from the church pastor down to its janitor, and not just churches, but religiously affiliated schools, hospitals, nonprofits, summer camps, you name it. Um, there are actually over 2 million workers that are uh, employed by religious organizations that this, um, whose in employment protections would be threatened if the ministerial exception were to be broadened as, as widely as um, religious conservatives would like it to be. Um, and unfortunately, conservatives have made pretty steady progress in expanding who counts as a minister. Um, it's ex increasingly common for courts to conclude that someone is a minister if their job has even the slightest religious component. Um, just to take an example off the top of my head, say like a teacher at a religious school who teaches entirely secular topics and maybe like once a year, um, helps to run a religious assembly, you know, or, you know, um, in which she prays with students or something like that. Um, and in some cases, courts are even agreeing that an employee is a minister just because their employer slipped a clause into their employment contract saying that they were a minister, um, uh, sometimes just randomly handing them a contract um, when they'd already been working there for years and telling them they have to sign it if they want to keep working and um, even if their job has no religious functions at all. So that is a far cry from the the priest and you know wanting to protect the Catholic Church's you know ability to say that like priests have to be men, you know. Um, and um, uh, so the expansion of of the ministerial exception to cover two million employees um, would be a really big deal. It would mean that those employees could be fired for literally any reason, um, for getting pregnant, for being di diagnosed with breast cancer, for uh, being a woman who was vocal about gender discrimination in the workplace. Um, those are all real examples, actually real examples of ministerial exception cases uh, that, were, that were decided by the courts, one of them by the Supreme Court. Um, where they said, you know, tough luck, even though those actions violate federal employment protections, your employer gets an exception. Um, so um, that's expanding what it means to be a minister. Um, really, really bad implications there. In addition, we're also starting to see an expansion of what kind of legal claims are no longer available to, to workers who have been wronged. Um, and, you know, it used to be that the ministerial exception would just prevent basically plaintiffs from prevailing on a hiring discrimination case or a wrongful termination claim. So with hiring and firing decisions. Um, but now we're seeing um, uh, workplace harassment claims getting barred. Um, uh, uh, defendant, religious defendants arguing that uh, they can get out of wage and hour regulations. Obviously, both of those things really disproportionately would affect women. Um, uh, given unequal pay and uh, sexual harassment in the workplace, and even you know things like contract claims and defamation claims, like all kinds of lawsuits that employers might want to bring um, against religious institutions, 
um, courts are increasingly saying, yeah, that's, you can't do that. The mineral, ministerial exception uh, bars that claim. Uh, so and none of those, you know, odd, you know, unusual types of claims that I just talked about have yet been accepted by the Supreme Court, but lower courts are encountering these arguments and some are agreeing with them. Um, the, the most jarring probably so far is the Seventh Circuit agreeing with a religious school that a hostile work environment claim brought by its gay music director was barred by the ministerial exception. They said, sorry, like he brought this, you know, hostile work environment claim um, because, of, you know, as a gay man in, you know, this religious school, he was subject to really a lot of mistreatment and harassment. Um, and they said, you can't even bring that, like that claim can't even proceed through uh, any any further litigation because of the ministerial exception. So um, yeah, um, not, not a great uh, situation and one that unfortunately has the potential to get a whole lot worse than it is right now. So something to watch and not, not something that's very well known. So hopefully, you know, tell your friends and yeah, stay on top of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, Maggie, go ahead. Yeah, so um, Dina, are th that's a ministerial exception, um, a a constitutional based um, exception that the court just keeps widening. Um, but are there other ways that people, other things people are using to get religious exemptions to discriminate in hiring? Um, yes, Maggie, there are. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, the. Uh, so not everybody can use the ministerial exception, right? Or church autonomy doctrine because they're not involved in preaching or teaching the faith. So there are, have been lots of attempts um, or a growing number of attempts, sorry, to use RIFRA by certain employee employers to get out of non-discrimination requirements um, to include the, like a for-profit employer in Texas. And a court has agreed and said, yes, you don't have, you can engage in discrimination. You could ignore Title VII, Title VII's prohibition on sex discrimination because you claim that you have religious beliefs that are counter to it. Um, so uh, again, an area to watch um, and it is um, evolving quickly. Um, and, you know, Hobby Lobby just opened the door and here we, and here we are. And I'm very worried about it. Um, so now we're going to, I'm going to turn the tables on Maggie and start asking her questions. Um, and we're going to switch to education now. So um, Americans United is a leader in the fight against private school vouchers um, across the country. Maggie, can you explain why private school vouchers are a church state issue and sort of connect the dots for us? Sure. So um, I think that uh, vouchers are a church state issue and they are an issue that feminists should care about. Um, so like 90% of the money that goes to private schools through private school vouchers goes to religious schools. And so those are the schools that um, are teaching a religious curriculum. They have a religious mission. They are teaching um, pretty much anything they want to teach. So they can teach uh, lessons about what they think a woman's role should be. Um, so they can have gendered curriculum. They can um, uh, discriminate. They can discriminate against uh, women in hiring. They can teach. They can discriminate against um, students in admission. They can teach anti-women curriculum, anti-LGBTQ stuff. Um, and, um, you know, there was a case in that went to the Supreme Court, the, the uh, Macon v. Uh, Carson v. Macon. And in that case, the uh, the state of Maine funded private schools to uh, provide a public education. So in Maine, it's so rural that there are some areas that they couldn't afford to have school districts themselves and public schools themselves because there weren't enough kids to go to them. And so they were sort of contracting out their public school services with private schools. And uh, there were a couple of students and their families who sued and they said, I understand that this is supposed to be public education, but you're funding a private school. And um, if you're funding private secular schools, then you have to fund my private religious school and you have to fund my private religious school to teach religion. 
And in the Carson case, the Supreme Court said, yes, if you are funding private secular schools, you have to fund private religious schools that teach religious education. The next issue in that case, which we're already seeing, the, the court didn't rule on it yet, um, they sort of left it, um, is what, what, what happens when those schools discriminate? Because the schools that those kids wanted to go to um, had statements of faith. Things like you must agree that life begins at conception and abortion is wrong. You must agree that LGBTQ um, kids are committing sin. Um, you must agree that you will get kicked out of the school if you perform any of these things that violate our co code of conduct. Um, really egregious, very right-wing conservative Christian viewpoints. And the Supreme Court really didn't want to have to get involved in that um, at that moment. And so they did not rule on that issue, but already... Uh, the schools in Maine that those kids wanted to go to are now suing the state of Maine, saying that the LGBTQ non-discrimination protections in that state that would prevent them from taking money and discriminating against kids violates their religious beliefs and is targeted towards them. And so the state can't apply it. So this is another example of a religious organization institution saying, you have to treat me exactly the same as everybody else when it comes to giving me money. I deserve money just like all the secular groups deserve money. And then once you give them money, they say, I am not like those secular groups at all. I get all of the exemptions I want. Um, so they get to, um, I guess, instead of um, have their cake and eat it too, they get to get their money and discriminate too. Um, so that is one of the main reasons why um, we really care about vouchers. Okay, so that is um, a good look at private school vouchers, but there's another sort of area of the law and education, um, and that's charter schools, which are generally thought of as public schools. But is that changing, Maggie? And why should people who care about women's rights be concerned? So Americans United has really not taken a position on charter schools because they, as Dina was saying, have always been considered public schools. And as public schools, the Constitution applies in the same way, non-discrimination laws apply in the same way. They are treated um, as public institutions. But since the Carson case that said if you fund a private secular school, you have to um, fund um, religious education as well at private schools, charter schools are really upping their fight to claim that they are now private schools. So they should be able to get money and they should be able to get out of non-discrimination laws and they should be able to teach religious education if they want. So there's two instances of this at the moment. One up at the Supreme Court now, they're trying to decide whether or not to take it is the, uh, uh, the case, I can't remember the full name, but it's the Peltier case. And this is a charter school in North Carolina that has a no pant rule for girls because girls should not wear pants. And that this is a, a matter for them of um, chivalry um, because um, girls are more delicate vessels than men and um, they should learn to play these roles um, at their charter school. So yes, yeah, so they're saying that they're a private school they're a private school that gets a charter and they get to do what they want. They don't have to adhere to non-discrimination laws. And then in Oklahoma, so that might go to the court. Um, and then in Oklahoma, uh, there is a currently a big fight there where a Catholic school has applied to be a charter school and they are not being subtle about their application. They are trying to make this a test case and really push what was in the Carson decision. And so they're saying, we're a Catholic school and we're gonna act as a Catholic school and kids are gonna have to go to mass and we are going to infuse Catholicism through our entire school. Um, and we're not a secular school, we're a Catholic school and they have um, um, other things like they are responding to how will you adhere to non-discrimination laws? And their answer is we will adhere to them so long as it doesn't violate our religious beliefs or conflict with our religious mission. And that is not just for, you know, uh, sex discrimination, LGBTQ discrimination, but also for disability discrimination. Um, so this is a really big deal. Um, and our charter schools might now be going in a fully different direction, depending on how these cases turn out. Um, so that is our really lengthy um, hour of church state doom. 
Um, but um, before we open to questions, I do want to say that a lot of these issues um, can be resolved by the Do No Harm Act. So if you care about Hobby Lobby, if you care about what Dina was talking about, about using RIFRA to discriminate, you can support the Do No Harm Act. And if that passes, that will change a lot of these things. Um, on the voucher front, we are losing all over the country, but you can stand up in your own states and fight against private school vouchers. Um, and we can sort of see where this charter school issue is going and fight back there as well. So not all is lost. Um, so does anyone have any questions about anything church-state separation issues we talked about or not? I see, Karen, you're, you went off mute. Actually, so I don't know how you normally do this. Do you raise hands? <laughs> I'll officially raise a hand. Okay, perfect. Okay, first, uh, Karen Humphrey from California and uh, a state which is much more protective of separation than many states, but, um, and a proud member of uh, AU and the Church and State Magazine is worth a read every month, uh, irrespective of what else you do. Um, and it's, <clears throat> and, I, and I think, all people, I'm a person of faith, but I'm not uh, a Christian nationalist by any means. And I think it's important to my faith to keep government out of it as well. I This has been developing over a number of years. Um, and the, the Do No Harm Act is not going to go anywhere in a Congress that has a majority of Republicans in the House and a 60 vote demand for everything in the US Senate. And so to what extent are you gonna be, um, and I know nonprofits have to be careful about how they involve themselves in elections, and I, but, but I'd be interested in knowing what organizations out there are supporting the kind of candidates who stand up for separation of church and state and who will support federal and, and state laws to do so. Uh, there, are, there are organizations that support, we, we, I'm with National Women's Political Caucus, we support uh, pro-choice, progressive women, uh, church state is not a specific item under our bottom line issues, but anti-discrimination is, and it is being harmed. So these things have been, I, I'm thinking the camel's nose, it used to be the camel's nose got, a, why the camel wants to be in the tent, I don't know anyhow, but the camel's nose used to be all that we got into the tent, and now I think we have everything except the camel's tail in the tent, and I guess I'm concerned about whether it's too late and how we focus on getting people into office at particularly the state and federal level that will try to turn this around because the Supreme Court is not gonna change for a number of years. And I thank you all for the presentations, very impressive. Thank you. Um, I will start with sort of the 50C, 501c3 answer. So we're 501c3, which means we can't endorse candidates as you acknowledged. Um, we um, we are starting a national recommitment campaign, recognizing that within the um, confines of, of a 501c3, what can we do? Um, we are recognizing that one of the things that has gone wrong, in addition to the court, which has gone very, very wrong, um, is that people sort of backed away from talking about church-state separation because it was like, oh, we don't wanna talk about religion, it's kind of controversial. Um, you know, I always sort of joke about like, you know, people say when you go to cocktail parties, don't talk about politics and religion. I'm like, well, I'm, I essentially can't go to cocktail parties, but like people wouldn't want to talk about it because they were afraid that they would look anti-religious because that was sort of the stigma. Um, and so I think a lot of people backed away from it um, and talked about a lot of the core issues that were affected by church state separation, but didn't talk so much about church state separation. So one of the things we're talking about is um, reclaiming it. Um, we have done polling that shows that people uh, support church state separation, that is, if a candidate talks about it, it doesn't prevent uh, people from wanting to vote for that candidate. Um, so talking about it as a core value, talking about why it is important, talking about the risks. Another thing is a lot of people were like, oh yeah, church state separation is in the constitution. So like, what do I have to worry about? And now suddenly people are really seeing it because the court has slowly chipped away, but now it's big. Um, and, you know, connecting the dots a little bit more, you know, sort of what we were doing here today about um, all of those different 
um, connections that it makes um, and how it affects the issues that you really care about. Um, Dina and Catherine, I don't know if you have more to, to answer on that or if you have any ideas of, of who really is taking that on as a pack. I just, I just don't know. No, I, I don't. Uh, I don't know either. I, one of the other things that we're doing is we sort of even handed outreach to candidates to just encourage them to talk about church state separation and to um, sort of talk about their faith and, and how to talk about their faith in a way that is acknowledges church state separation, but acknowledges that they are people of faith. Um, because that's a, as Maggie said, it's kind of a tricky line, um, and so that is that's another thing that we are doing, emphasizing how important it is, and giving people tools about how to talk about it. Um, and without putting you on the spot, Connie has mentioned that the ERA could help. I will be honest; before this call, I even like checked in with. Um, Rob Boston, who writes Church State Magazine and who's been working on this issue a lot and asking like, what has AU done on that? And um, and what would our position be? And he looked through all of our stuff and we have not taken a position. So again, Connie, I don't want to put you on the spot or if someone else would want to talk about how they think that could affect it. I actually can't answer it because we haven't really worked on it. Um, so I can hold, oh, there you go, Connie. It's just... Another thing to look at, along with a million other things, but I do think that uh, this question did not come from me. It came from Shelly O'Brien, uh, but she sent it to me, I suppose, because I'm listed as the host. But at any rate, I, I think it's a very valid thing. I think that if women had more standing in the Constitution, we would have more say. We'd be more equal citizens instead of being shunted off to a secondary role sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yep, that makes sense. Um, Susan, you have a question. I'm also, thank you very much for the presentation. It was so interesting. And um, obviously we all have a lot to be worried about. One of the worries that um, I've cultivated during this uh, presentation is how all of this discriminatory, um, all of these practices are being modeled for our young people. It normalizes, it normalizes it. And so you, you think of all these, you know, um, institutions, these schools, um, Hobby Lobby, um, it's, it's normalizing something that our country, I mean, I thought we worked so hard for this not to happen. And I'm just so concerned about it. That's all I want to say. And, and thank you so much uh, for your work. Thank you. Um, I just. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll add that I think one of my focuses is schools, And I think it is in part because of what you are saying that we are sending money out of the public school system into religious schools for them to teach these messages. So we are funding the teaching um, of this religious doctrine that a lot of people don't agree with and that can really be harmful to a lot of people. So I think the school issues are particularly uh, problematic. And of course, you know, even in our public schools, we are seeing um, a big chipping away. And I don't know, um, Dina and, and um, Catherine might want to add to this. Is, is there, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you um, and, and, and pardon my ignorance, but is there a way to work with the Department of Education on this? Um, is there a way that the civil rights group is looking at the within the Department of Education? Are they looking at this? I know they're aware of what's going on, but is there a working group addressing some of this? Because this is, I mean, this stuff being normalized, you've got these kids growing up and this is just going to be, you know, standard operating procedure to discriminate against, you know, women and all kinds of other groups. The so we run with AASA the coalition that fights private school vouchers. Um, we do talk to the Department of Education about that a lot. Um, the Obama administration and the Biden administration oppose private school vouchers. Um, they're both aware. Well, the, the Biden administration is aware and concerned about the charter issue as well. So far as we know, um, the Trump administration clearly with Betsy DeVos uh, had a very different view. 
Um, but, um, you know, some of the things like, you know, the, the, uh, some of them, th the things are a little harder and I don't actually know where they've come down on the ministerial exception and other things. Okay. okay. Thank you. Mackie, did you wa want to talk about the prayer guidance really quickly since you didn't get a chance to get to that? Sure. Uh, Dina, do you want to, that that or do you want to? Whoever was supposed to, we didn't have time for it, but I feel like it's a, an um, Dina, do you want me to, or do you want to? Uh, uh, doesn't matter. You, why don't you do it? Okay. So, um, following last summer's Supreme Court decision in Kennedy v. Bremerton High School, which said that a football player, a football coach, can say a brief, quiet, personal prayer, um, on you know on the football field after games, if the students or the players are otherwise occupied. Um, so it's pretty limited to its facts, but needless to say, people are trying to expand that and suggest that, um, you know, because of the Kennedy decision, you can put up 10 commandments in the schools or teachers can pray anytime they want with students. Um, in response to those, um, efforts to expand the limited decision, the, um, Department of Education just put out um, updated prayer guidance, um, guidance on how, uh, what school prayer within public schools and religious expression within public schools. Um, and uh, it was very good and clear and clarified what the roles are for teachers and how public school teachers have the right to religious expression, but it has to be quite limited um, in when, and they can't ever coerce students. So. They are doing, um, they're doing good within like the context of public schools. They just recently put this out. And I think that was a, uh, an important opportunity for them. Um, Janet, you have a question. Yes, I did have a question. Um, this also dovetails into the fact that we have in most schools very little accurate sexual education and into you know lack of understanding on contraception the fact that we have the highest one of the highest rates of sexually transmitted disease because they're not taught proper things in school because wherever abstinence is taught they don't teach contraception or sexually transmitted diseases and i just have some concerns about that given given our enormous rates of sexually transmitted diseases for a wealthy country I mean, you're exactly right. And this is, again, I feel like I'm being like doom and gloom, but you know, it's getting worse with a sort of parental rights movement, right? Where um, it is, we're going to control the books you can read and the education you can have and the history you can learn. Um, and, you know, it's all tied in because the same people that are pushing the, the fake CRT um issues are actually their solution is private school voucher so they are their their idea is um they want to control the public school so that the amount that they can but they also want to create distrust so that um they can so that people don't like their public schools people question their teachers their school boards and then they want to send their kids to private school private religious schools with government money to sort of destroy the system um which is really really troubling and again Another reason why it is really important to get involved in local politics, school board politics, um, and pay attention that, to what is happening um, at your at the lower level. And because the courts are bad, um, the 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 lobbying about this, the the standing up on these issues, um, and you know, as a C three, I can't say elections are important, um, but all of these things are very important. Thanks. Um, Hi, uh, thanks for the fantastic presentation. Uh, one of the questions I had remaining was with the DC vouchers, have you all done any analysis of the implications of any of the religious aspects, religious schools participation in the DC vouchers and what have you found? So the DC voucher also predominantly funds religious schools. 
Um, and though technically the DC voucher is not supposed to fund schools that discriminate on the basis of religion, um, Sam, who works with us and, and who does a lot of work um, with NCPE, the National Coalition for Public Education, um, has found on a lot of schools' websites statements of faith. Um, whether they say they don't apply them to kids who are using vouchers or not, we're not quite clear. Um, there are lots and lots of studies of the DC voucher. It's the most studied voucher in the country. And um, all of those studies show that um, kids aren't improving in meeting or, or in reading or math. And in some years, it's shown that their, their test scores have declined. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's really hard to study these programs because they're set up so that they are hard to study. And so we don't know exact curriculum or anything like that, though we um, have, again, recently been working uh, with offices on the Hill to do um, some letters from members of Congress to the Department of Education to find out more information. We did that during the DeVos years. Um, but again, sort of the way the systems are set up, um, the DeVos Department of Education would respond and say, I don't know, you'd have to ask the schools themselves. It's not our, like, we don't have to ask them these questions, um, whether or not they're discriminating or what their statements of faith are, or those sorts of things. And um, though there is a bar on, on religious discrimination, there's no mechanism to enforce it. There's no way to complain. There's no penalties if you violate it. Um, and so who knows um, what is really happening. Um, but, but maybe we'll find out more with a more friendly Department of Education if we can get that letter sent again. Um, Connie. Sounds like a good idea. Yes, we will, we'll be coming to you to sign things for that probably. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be delighted. Uh, and just one other uh, clarification on the new Department of Ed uh, guidance on uh, no prayers and schools. Uh, what specifically was a new aspect that they uh, focused on in this guidance? I couldn't quite figure it out. Well, it, it was updated guidance that clarified things, but the law didn't actually change that much um, in the with that decision last summer. Um, the, the law is still the same. The public school employees, public schools can't coerce students or players to pray. So um, it just uh, explained that concept, said that nothing in the Kennedy decision changed it, and also reminded um, teachers and school employees about their responsibility or the, the fact that, you know, yes, you can engage in personal conduct and yes, that can be religious, but it, it has to be within certain parameters. It can't just be all the time. So it just kind of set out some extra reminders and clarified things, but it, the the law didn't change. And it was it was important to have that reminder and those guidance because ever since the Kennedy decision, we've been seeing totally bonkers state, you know, bills being introduced and even you know pat getting near past or or passed. Um, you know, like Maggie mentioned, like Ten Commandments in schools, which is there's nothing to do with prayer. I mean, like that was decided by a totally separate case, you know, and um, I mean, we have uh, someone on staff who's a big part of his job is, is basically monitoring state legislation. And he comes in and sits in in the first 10 minutes of every one of our legal department meetings every Monday. And he just gives us like a parade of all the state legislation and like 90% of it is stuff in schools and it's prayer in schools, chaplains in schools, you know, 10 commandments in schools. Um, so uh, there's been a massive amount of state legislative activity on that. So it was important for the Department of Educa Education to take a clear stance. I have one other concern about a very current issue, and that is this critical race theory and what's happening with the, the changing of history. And if that couldn't, in fact, affect women and also affect the truth about church and state separation. And what do we do to fight that? Have you have you guys considered that one? <laughs> yeah, that's an easy question. I'm just kidding. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of those issues um, are about local school board fights. Um, you know, it, as again, we were talking about elections. I think people oftentimes think about elections as like who's going to be the president, and they forget about the fact that 
who's on your school board affects your schools. And then those people move up to become your mayors, to become your state legislators, to become your congressmen. And so, um, and that's the network that's built um, around them. And so all of these local things and talking to your, um, your, your neighbors about these issues, I think can be really important. Um, you know, one thing, uh, there, there's a group um, that we work with in the voucher space and they did a poll recently. And one of the questions they asked their folks was, where do you get the news that you trust? And I think that they were expecting it to be like, you know, 50% say I trust Fox News and 50% say they you know, support MSNBC. And they'd be like, oh, okay. So like we need to go to these big networks. And the answer was they pay a lot of attention to letters to the editor and their local paper. And so I was really surprised by that because I thought that was, you know, like I just, I thought that might've been like super old school and like are people really reading these, these issues? And it turns out that they are. Um, and so that is something that everyone on this call can do, right? When there is something that 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 they're really concerned about and they know something about, they can write this in their local papers and their neighbors read it. Um, and they might not have heard it anyplace else. And it might be someone that they're like, I've known that person my whole life or they're my neighbor or, you know, and, and that can really change their mind on a topic. Um, Susan. The point I wanted to make is that we now have almost two generations of people being educated with having no idea what the fairness doctrine was and what news really is. So in every class I teach that comes up that this was discontinued during the Reagan administration, which brought about the polarity of the news outlets and which brought about um, the end of the requirement to tell both sides of the story. Not one student in all the years I have taught now even knew it existed. Hmm. So um, I, I think that, you know, and, and what I do is I build it into the fact that you know, when, when you're writing essays and all of that, you have to have credible information and, and all of that and you, whatever. So I, I think that's really, really important. And I think that, I don't know, there's, anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, Karen. Yeah, um, thank you again. I, I, I appreciate the point about letters to the editor. I think getting in where, where, <laughs> My newspaper now prints maybe 10 letters to the editor an entire week in the print version. I'm still one of those Luddites who gets a print paper, but, but they have tremendously long uh, comment streams on, uh, for, for various stories. And, and I learn a lot about some of these cases, particularly the Texas laws that are currently being pushed um, from reading national papers online. So I think that we, and also, I, I, I don't do social media, but a great many people do. And that is a place um, either to create social media platforms to allow discussion around these issues in a respectful way. Um, so, I, I mean, I think there, I think your notion, though, about reaching out to individuals or people who realize that these comments and, and concerns are coming from individuals um, is really important. Uh, we have a school board in my area of Sacramento being considered very liberal that has been taken over by conservative forces, uh, but has a special election soon for the swing seat. And I don't think the community knows about it. And I don't think the paper has even noticed the, the change in the at attitudes and atmosphere of that place. So, um, and, and local news is going away. I was in TV when they took away the, the fairness doctrine and the point is absolutely correct. We have no, <sighs> And, it's, and in many cases, there's more than two sides, which is really frustrating. I mean, the, the news don't give context. So we're going to have to enhance our personal ways of communication as much as possible. But I think that was a very good point that was brought up. Yeah. And, you know, a, a, a last um, point of like something positive. So I grew up in Ocean City, New Jersey, and um, this year they elected three Moms for Liberty candidates. And, you know, I would say that we're, for New Jersey, we're conservative, um, but my town has always been kind of just like very moderate, not really wading into any issues. And then there became a challenge to the 
um, whether or not they were going to implement the sex education standards by New Jersey. And it became a big thing. And I was like, I don't I'm, like what is happening. And a lot of people in the community were like, what is happening? Um, and it ended up that one of my um, good friends from high school was a teacher in the area. And they just started organizing. They just started talking to each other. Another one of my um, high school uh, she was on the swim team with me. She was on the school board and she took the position of how important it was to have sex, sex education for students. And so it came very quickly that they were, you know, all sort of joined together and they defeated this measure. And now they're just like much more alert. So, and, you know, I was talking to them because I have a job in this. Um, but if I'm sure if I were just a, you know, a DC organization that started sending them stuff, right, they'd be like, great, thanks, random person. But I was like, hey, we went to like kindergarten together. Here's some information. Um, and it was um, it was taken in a much different way. And we won. Great. We are at 128. I don't know if anyone does anything to close it out, if I should be sending it back to Sue or Connie or someone. I, I actually have to leave in just a minute, but I want to tell you, this is one of the best brown bags without the food that we have ever done. <laughs> oh, that's so great. I'm so glad to hear that. I really have enjoyed this, and I would love to, I'm glad this recording will be on our website once you guys have approved everything on it and everything. Sherry will take care of that. And uh, I don't have anything more to say except thank you, thank you, thank you for a really well done presentation. Sue, do you have anything to say? Yes, I want to thank you all so much and also for uh, helping to write up the summary of the meeting, which I hope you will also be able to use in some of your own publications. And to mention that our next meeting will be on the third Tuesday in June, June 20th, rather than our usual fourth Tuesday. So we hope you will all come. Is Holly uh, Joseph on? She left. Well, there she is. I am. Holly, any uh, luck with lining up speakers for our June 20th meeting? I wish I could tell you that no, they were all <laughs> signed up and everything, but it's in development. <laughs> so we're going to have the elections part of the meeting, uh, which um, will elect uh, the new members of our. Uh, Clearinghouse on Women's Issues Board, and then have some speakers uh, focusing on the topic that Holly had suggested of how can uh, women be more effective in attaining our goals. Holly, do you want to say anything more? Oh, about I, I was a, a different way of saying how can women's voices be more heard. You know, I, I think we come to that question all the time and just to explore it, but but who who best can discuss it? If you have suggestions, please let us know. Because yeah, it'll. Because I guess if we knew, we'd hear more from women, right? Right. <laughs> right? Okay. Thank you. Okay. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much. We'll see you at the next virtual brown bag. Bye.